Hey what's up fellow viewers, today I will be doing a video commentary on one of my games at the Nationals that was held last weekend. Now I'm actually quite surprised I even got any coverage, oh it was a very big tournament, more than 150 attendees. To even get coverage on one video is actually quite astonishing. So I'm actually glad I'm able to bring this to you today because this is the one game of the entire day that I feel is most worth commentary, commenting on and it so happened that this was the one game that was recorded. So I'm playing HB on the right, ETF up, uh, it's the usual uh, Jammy food codes, not food codes sorry, Jammy HB up against Geist. Now the, before the game started, before I took my first turn, you can see I'm fiddling with my deck box right here. The game has already started even before it's begun. Can you guess what I'm trying to do in my deck box? Those of you on UK Slack might know, but for the rest of you, you'll find out later. So, um, across me is my opponent, Simon. Simon is a very surprise, uh, uh, surprise player that, that uh, surprised everyone by making a top 16. Because not because he's a lousy player or anything, but because of his IDs. Guys wasn't the most conventional ID. It's strong. Guys is strong. Don't get me wrong. But he also brought along with him biotech. Jinteki Biotech, the ID, the one that, the flip ID, and made top 16 with it. That is an amazing achievement. So props to my opponent for that. Uh, makes me feel like <laughs> my thunder has been stolen, stole, stolen a little because he is definitely the crowd favorite here. Everyone wants to see guys win and I have to be the bad guy by defeating him. Or will I? Will I lose? Let's find out. I begin. I have my, an opening hand of two Enderun Ice, a Turing and a Magnet, along with a bit of money. But most importantly, I started with Tama. Targeted Marketing, the one-off in my deck. I found it in my opening hand. I'm going to play it and I'm going to name Tech Trader right off the bat. So, this will stifle my opponent's economy. Tech Trader is the fundamental to any spy cam deck's economy. And when you can name it with Tama, you will completely cripple their early game. Or they'll cave in, play as normal and give you a whole lot of money to play Biotic Labor for. So I absolutely love uh, the fact that I was able to open with this. Now I had to make a subpar play here, I had to install the tiering on R&D here. Reason being, normally I can let R&D open, especially against guys because they don't get more than single accesses, but here is a must because I do not want my opponent running to R&D, stealing an agenda and erasing Tama. That's a very smart thing for my opponent to do. And he knows that. My opponent's a good player. You can see, he immediately tries to poke R&D to get the agenda to erase my current. He fails to do so with the Turing, res, and... Yeah, so he just uh, plays a Fall Guy and looks at his, his cards wistfully as he wishes he can play his Tech Trader. So, um, he's still going to get a bit of money. Double Fall Guy will give him a bit of money, but... I'm really stifling his economy here, don't get me wrong. Tech Trader is so, so, so important for the economy. And meanwhile, my economy is unrestrained because with ETF's ability, you're getting a lot of mileage. Um, even after raising the Turing and raising the Magnet on HQ, I'm still within an okay credit level. Six credits, that's not too bad. And you notice they're both end runs. So very importantly, this means that um, until he finds his decoder, he cannot actually poke around in my centrals. And even if he does, he doesn't run Desperado. So he's losing money trying to get rid of my current. Um, and that is definitely not a winning pr proposition for my opponent. So he's forced to basically sit back here and build up his board state without actually building up his board state. He can't play his tech trader. Well, he can. He doesn't want to. Alright. In the meantime, I'm just going to build up uh, my remote server and start scoring out. Um, this is actually quite important against criminal. Uh, you do want to score some early agendas the normal way because I don't expect myself to be rich this game. So, once I score a couple of agendas normally, I can score the rest using biotic labels. I don't have infinite bio biotics either, so it would be good to score some the normal way. You better do this before Guy sets up all his breakers. Once he has 4 or 5 cloud breakers going, uh, you can't tax him out of the remote. Now you notice my opponent installed a bunch of interesting cards. There's Bazaar and Replicator. My opponent is not really playing traditional guys, he's playing more of like Spy Cam Haley Geist. Uh, Spy Cam Haley, but in guys, which is a very interesting uh, way to play it. So basically, I'm trading Panchatantra, Sharpshooter, and Clone Chip Recursion for guys breakers, which is actually not too bad. And you get the amazing ID ability on top of it. You get uh, hand replenishing with the extra card draw from all the trash abilities. 
which makes Tech Trader all but much but all the more better. Now he does have some backup economy. His economy is not purely Tech Trader. He has Fall Guys, and you can see he has um, Tech Writer. So that's pretty good economy, but it's not. But it's finite. That's the most important thing. His economy is finite. So sooner or later, I'll be able to grind his economy to a halt, until he finally caves in and in and uh play plays his tech traders. That's my hope, at least. We'll see if I can accomplish that or if he'll find a way to get rid of my current. Now he continues drawing up. It's a very slow game for him, but also quite a slow game for me. I'm trying to find my second piece of ice on the remote. I don't just want a single piece of ice. I believe it's an Eli at the base of the remote, so I can't really score out behind it just yet. It's doubly dangerous to score out because um, if I if I, um, he actually manages to check the remote or plays a, plays an inside job, I'm kind of done. My current my current goes away. I lose an agenda, and my opponent gets to build up his board state. So we don't want that. Now my opponent here uh, replicates his spy camps, gets six of them on the table. I'm so happy that there are no tech traders on the board at this point, but he does get 6 credits on the tech writer. So again, it might seem like my Tama is not doing much, but um, yeah, again, the tech writer money is finite, sooner or later he'll have to use it, and it will run out pretty quickly, given how taxing my eyes is. So let's fast forward the video because things tend to get... Uh, this game is actually plays out rather slowly. Okay. All right, and then he gets the passport down. Passport is huge here. Passport means he can get through Turing for one credit. Magnet still costs three, so that's pretty painful. But I anticipated the, the passport, and I put the architect on R and D. So this allows me to easily defend R and D, make it a double layer gear check for him to get through, and make it very very taxing. I look at the top five cards of my R and D, and I think I show it to the camera here. Most importantly, you can see that there's a Baltic neighbor, three pieces of ice, and the last card, the bottommost card, is a Kronos project. So I'm almost certainly installing one of the ice here, and it's almost certainly going into the on the remote. Sorry. Um, with that ice, I am able to uh, now actually slot an agenda in the remote and score it. This is a third click run on R and D, so he can still try to attempt to get the agenda. Hence, I need to find a good piece of ice to put on the remote. After some thought, I decided that Architect would be the best piece of ice to put on the remote because um, Ichi doesn't really do much, maybe. Sniping the passport is kind of huge though, um, but considering my innermost piece of ice, I don't really recall what it is. I think it's an Eli, but I can't be 100% sure. I, let's fast forward the video. I go for the Architect, and then I install Vitruvius from my hand. At this point, I'm relatively flooded. As you notice, the game's a couple turns in. I um, haven't actually scored any agendas yet, so my hand is full of agendas. Um, so HQ was actually the right server for my opponent to attack here. But it is more expensive of course, you have to consider that Magnet. That's one reason I chose Magnet over Enigma, uh, the fact that it taxes out passport so much. Now, score the Vitruvius, that's, get, that's one less agenda in circulation, and the current stays in play. Now, firing the Architect is actually really huge, really really huge, because I have as much, no much knowledge of my deck as my opponent will now have. He's going to start popping spy cameras, not only to get card draw, but to try to sp uh, snipe an agenda to get rid of my current. Well, I know that there are no agendas coming anytime soon, until the Kronos project, which is card number 5. So I know that all spy camera triggers from this point on will be safe until I get to that card. So that is a really really huge deal, and in retrospect, that architect on R&D was very very valuable. The fact that he ran into it without uh, any sentry breakers was actually a very big deal. Now here, I thought he was going to fire the spy camera, but I realized he was trying to use his second ability. Look at the top 6 cards, and rearrange them in the order that he likes. Fast forward again, not much to see here. Yeah, this game actually took quite a lot. Uh, we um, especially my opponent was a bit slow on his uh, on play on his play, and as you see, that will come into play later on. Uh, let's see the turning wheel. Okay, turning wheel comes down, and you can probably suspect he's going to hit HQ here. And I'm not on too many credits, only on five credits. Uh, but I do rest the Eli anyway. It's not the best piece of ice, but it stops him from getting to HQ easily, and that's quite a big deal. Again. I have a lot of agendas in hand. 
I cannot afford to let him hit one of them. So, uh, <laughs> I'm very messy with my credits here, but it's basically install take two. Is it an agenda in the remote? Probably not. That is almost certainly bait. The Ultimo size is an architect. If he checks it, he is going to be in a lot of trouble. He tries to play a spy cam here. I know what's coming up. It's not an agenda. This is card number three, I think. Um, you'll notice I tilted the cards on my R&D. This is uh, a crutch that I normally use in uh, casual play to reduce the mental load. You know, Netrunner is a game that's very taxing on memorization and any way to reduce the mental load really helps a lot. Uh, I've been informed that this might not be proper tournament etiquette. I'm not very sure about that, but if it is, uh, I'll need to start kicking the habit. But as of now though, there is no... Uh, there's no unfair advantage I'm ga gaining by doing this. It's just to make it easier. Also, it makes it easier for my opponent if that's uh, any constellation. So, uh, things continue moving. Let's speed up the video. My opponent starts installing more breakers. So, it's at this point that my re remote starts looking less and less safe. I believe the card I slaughtered in the remote is an Ash. And my opponent gets his uh, dog out. So now he has two decoders, one for centrals, one for the remote, which is pretty good. And the shift comes out as well. So at this point, I'm no longer safe. My opponent has his rig set up, and he can get through the remote at his will. This is a big problem. So let's continue moving on with the video. Oh yes, he actually installs all the breakers and tries to run my remote. Um, so yeah, I wasn't really expecting that, but I did have the Turing, which I could rest. I chose to rest the Turing instead of the Architect, because I wanted the Architect to be kept as a surprise. Um, and the Turing was more taxing anyway. It would cost him 4 credits to break with the Lady, uh, sorry, the Rex, which he did, and all he saw was, was the Ash. He thought that was an agenda that I was trying to sneak through, he was wrong, and he paid a very expensive price. Just like that, I sapped away a lot of his credits. I know I'm poor as well, but he's also poor. We are both poor. By his choice. He chose not to install his tech writer, tech trader, sorry. And so in doing so he's making both of us poor. But I'm coming out ahead. Unlike him, I have ETF credits, so I'm making a lot more money than he is. He is a lot more click compression going my way. Instead my opponent's on one credit with very little he can do. Um so at this point i I think I felt very safe jamming the Vitruvius in the remote. I believe that's a Vitruvius in the remote right now, and my opponent is giving his next move, I think. We shall skip ahead. Yeah, my opponent dodo on quite a bit. I will, did tell him to speed up a bit, um, but he did spy cam and saw the ABT. Uh oh. So yeah, I did actually try to take the Kronos project uh, from my deck. One thing you didn't realize was that when I Mendon Trinity drew the fourth card from the Architect, I actually drew the fifth card as well, the Kronos project, to ensure that it get, went into my hand instead of being spy camped. So this allowed me to uh, get rid of the agenda that was on top of R&D, but unfortunately it revealed yet another agenda, the ABT. So he's now running through R&D, and obviously he can easily do that. Gets, uh, uses all his credits and steals the ABT. Bad luck for me, there goes Tama. So that was very very unfortunate. Um, if I could hold on for a couple more spy camps, I would actually be in a decent position. And I believe by this time I did have a Jackson Howard in my hand, so having a Jackson Howard in naked remote would actually help me against spy camps. He's way too poor to t trash Jackson Howard, so yeah, in retrospect maybe I should have installed a Jackson Howard. I'm not sure if I actually had it in my hand in at that point, but that is something I could have done, and that is something I should have done, to be honest, if I had the option. Uh, Jackson Howard is really one of the few way, few outs against spy camps for that matter. Um, Project Atlas helps, uh, Lily Lockwell helps, but those are rather esoteric cards that are not seen in modern competitive decks. Jackson is the one card that is ubiquitous, so ubiquitous, ubiquitous, ubiquitous. Yes, um, so you really want to abuse that, and coupled with the fact that my opponent is poor, having a naked Jackson is completely fine. Now. I believe that's a Vitruvius in remote, I could score it now, um, but that will bring me to zero credits. And more importantly, that's not my ma best line of play. I'm looking at my hand, there's an archive memories in there that I had since probably turn 1, and I'm thinking, he has installed one tech trader. Well, if you want more, <laughs> you have to pay for it, or let me have my money. So I archive memories for, tech, uh, for Tama, and I retargeted 
tech trader. So the thing with guys is that they don't, and spy cam Haley decks for that matter, is that they don't really get going. They go, don't really snowball until they actually have two tech traders out. This is something that you can, uh, you learn by simply observing spy cam games. With one tech trader, they are treading water, I guess. Um, they still need that, their credits to install breakers, to use regular breakers to break stuff. So getting one extra credit for each trash can is actually not all that good. Only when you are on two or more tech traders do you really start snowballing out of control. And that's where the deck is becomes very difficult to beat. So by suppressing this, by target uh by targeting tech trader, I'm hoping that uh, my opponent will continue to play at a very slow I mean to build at a very slow play pace or give me the credit injection that I need to start Baltic uh using Baltic labels to uh quickly win the game. So it's a win-win for me. And at this point, my opponent still has no good way of um, actually getting rid of my current. Um, he could leg work into HQ, but that's a very expensive proposition at this point. And um, R&D, really, he's only out uh, once again, the spy cameras. He finally finds his source of link, which allows him to actually install more breakers. So let's fast forward to that. Yep, so he installs his spike and passes the turn over to me. And I scored a Vitruvius here. Uh, there's a new card in the remote that's a Naked Jackson Howard. Again, as I said, I, I'm not sure if I had it in hand. If I had it, I really should have installed it before my tech, uh, Tama got eroded. Um, if I could keep that Tama on the board, if I didn't have to archive memories for it, my opponent would have a very difficult time actually uh, getting any headway in this game. So with the Jackson Howard naked, um, it's very difficult, difficult for my opponent to trash it. And at this point, I think I actually have a lot of Jackson Howards available. I was soon to draw into all of them. Um, so this meant that if he was going to run into my Jackson Howard, I would actually let, let him trash it. Because he's so, so poor, he actually can't even afford to check my remote. Because he can't afford to trash Jackson Howards, so why bother checking? So, game goes on. He continues assembling his breakers, making it very, very unsafe for me to actually uh, score in the remote. So because of this, I tried to bait my opponent into running the remote by installing the Jackson in the remote. So now I have two Jacksons on the table, one in the naked remote, one behind the Turing. And by clicking for credits, um, I actually get up four credits, which means I can rest Architect. Uh, my opponent at this point does not have a sentry breaker, so it actually looks safe for me to score this agenda, but this is actually bait. If he actually runs through this server without a sentry breaker, I'm going to be able to fire Architect. And this is why I'm hoping to bait him into. He's thinking here, if I run through on click 1, I can click through an Ichi and break the Turing. Uh, surely, surely, uh, that's the worst thing that could happen. So after some thought, I think my opponent does decide to run my remote here. Uh, suspecting that I might be trying to score an agenda. Meanwhile, I check his heap because I do know I have the Kronos project in hand. Remember the architect fire? I do have the Kronos project in hand. I do have a biotech labor in hand. Once I have 6 credits, and once he has used up enough cards from his stack, it's time to fire the Kronos. But for now, my opponent spends... Uh, he runs on... I'm not sure which click this is. It seems like click, click 3, which is quite a big mistake. But anyway... Click 3 it is, I do fire the second architect for the second time, and this time I don't show my hand to the opponent. But I look through, and installing ice is probably the safest option, so I install on HQ, because I think there are two agendas in hand at this point. And my opponent can actually very easily get through HQ, sneak a siphon in, sneak a legwork in, both of which are very very bad for me. So ice goes on HQ, and I take a credit from ETF, he uses crowbar to get past curing, Pretty good for him, gets credits. Now, because he allowed me to fire the architect, I was able to install advanced assembly lines from my heap, my archives, and this allows me to res it, bringing me, me up to 3 credits. This allows me to res the ash, bringing me back down to 1 credit. Very cute plays here, um, made all possible by the architect. So letting HP fire architect is a very very huge problem for my opponent. Suddenly I have the money to res ash, and boom, that's Jackson. With 3 credits left. He really, really, really cannot afford to trash either Ash or Jackson. He lets both of them stay. So that's a huge win for me right there. Um, he does get another uh, crowbar out, however. So this makes 
jamming another uh, agenda in a remote a lot less good. So here I'm definitely contemplating, do I jam a remote into the Ash server or what do I do? Um, at this point I'm happy to jam a, uh, an agenda in a remote but it really doesn't seem safe. Sure, he doesn't have a sentry breaker but he could easily have a ship in hand, he could easily draw into one by using spy cam. So I didn't feel safe. Um, because of this, I decided to install the third copy of Jackson Howard into the Ash server. Uh, you'll see me do that very soon. Yes, I replace uh, the Jackson with another Jackson, thinking that he might actually have an out into my remote. And this was to be the game losing play for me. Spoiler alert, I lost this game. Um, yeah, I should have jammed something like a Kronos project into that remote. Why didn't I do this? I have no idea. What I did do however is to fire the advanced assembly lines immediately because I wanted the one credit from ETF. I was very very poor. I was clicking for credits for most of this game as was my opponent. Um, because he didn't want to budge, he was very stubborn, didn't want to give me my Talma money. So we were both playing a very slow drawn out game which I was completely fine with. However, um, this meant that I needed to squeeze every single credit out uh, for efficiency and this was why I chose to install an ice with advanced assembly lines. It was very unlikely that I was going to install any more ice anywhere else anyway. So I was just going to put it on the naked Jackson Howard to make it more of a deterrent uh, to run it. My opponent uh, dodos on for a bit more. And something happens. I'm not exactly sure what happens here. Let's rewind it. I did lose a couple credits here for some reason. I have 5 credits. Oh, he runs HQ. I see. Yes, he runs HQ. So I rest the Ichi on HQ. He clicks through the Ichi, lets the trace fire and jacks out. Very interesting choice here by him. I'm not sure why he jacked out. If he really wanted an agenda, he might as well con uh, continue through the e Eli and Magnet. Uh, he could easily do that if he wanted to. I'm not sure why he didn't, especially since he really spent the time clicking through the Ichi. So on to my turn, I install an upgrade on HQ and take two credits. This upgrade was meant to look like a Christian grid to deter any siphons on legworks, but it ended up being an ash because I didn't have a Christian grid. If I did, obviously I would res it. I mean, I would uh, uh, slam it on HQ. Uh, the main reason why I put Ash on HQ was 1. To make it look like Christian Grid and 2. To make use of my ETF credits because otherwise I'll just be clicking for 3 credits which is not the best obviously. Uh, more modeling, more modeling, nothing happens, nothing happens and we get to the point where my opponent decides that he has had enough of my Tama bullshit. He takes a bunch of money from Tech Writer and then, now that he has a bunch of money, not a lot, it's still enough to get through any server of his choice. He draws, and now he can uh, get the shift down, which now threatens my, my remote. Again, there's no agenda in my remote, all the agendas are in my hand, I don't have enough to power take them out. I'm looking at my Jackson Howard and I decide, okay, it's time to hyper draw to get rid of the Jackson. Uh, the excess agendas from my hand, and then take some money. Uh, at this point, I was drawing not so, uh, not just to clear the agendas from my hands because I was expecting a legwork. More importantly, I was trying to draw into my hedge funds and my blue levels because I really, really needed the money. I my opponent has been doing a decent job at actually pressuring me. Had he not run HQ, I'll be on ten credits now. I could play a restructure, but instead, I'm at a pretty poor credit level, and that's not good for me. I've been desperately trying to get up to restructure level for quite some time now and this is one of the problems of playing restructure in Rushi ETF. Uh, sometimes you just don't get the opportunity to play that restructure once you begin scoring agendas this quickly. And that is a flaw of the deck. Uh, that is something I need to patch up in future iterations of the deck. But anyway, back to the game. My opponent is uh, doing guys things, selling four guys and everything. And discarding cards that he won't really use. Notice my opponent has a bit of money now but is still rather suffocated. He doesn't really have a way to get agenda points just yet. Although he does have a lot of breakers set up so at this point I'm basically committed into playing two Baltic labors for the win. 
I'm taking money here because I really really want to play the restructure for my hand next turn. Next turn will be credit credit restructure, bring up to 15 credits, allow me to biotic two agendas for the win. I think at this point I have one agen one or two agendas, one agenda I think in hand, as well as one biotic labor. My opponent plays freedom three quality. This removes the targeted marketing and allows him to play a tech trader. With that tech writer money, he was able to actually get rid of my current, as well as liberate himself, get his engine set up, and now he's going to run through R&D. Using turning wheel counters to see two cards, hopefully hitting an agenda here to trigger freedom through equality. And of course he gets it. Accelerator beta test brings him immediately up to 5 points. I was holding my breath there. The second card could have been an agenda that won him the game, but it wasn't. So he's up actually 5 points. He's ahead of me now. This is bad news bears. Fast forward, um, I finally get to play my restructure. This is the moment I've been waiting for. Now I'm holding my breath here, not because I'm afraid he'll top deck the winning agenda from my R&D, not because I'm scared that he will now snowball out of control with uh, two, three tech traders. I was holding my breath because I was hoping he wouldn't levy. And when he finally took his last click, didn't levy, I was very happy to play a Bouting Labor, Triple Advance, Score, Runner's Project, done. So, we are tied up 5-5, five to five, but I am in control of this game. My opponent cannot cycle through his deck again. He cannot hammer R I mean, he cannot lock my R&D with spy cameras. He has to use the rest of his deck to find the final winning agenda. And it cannot be a two one pointer. I still have one more Chronos in my deck. That won't win him the game. He needs a two pointer and he needs to find it before I find the final biotic labor into ABT of Vitruvius combo. So I fast forward the game a bit more here. Uh, nothing much happens. Finds, finally finds his mongoose. That was the card he was looking for all this while. He really really wanted his sentry breaker and he finally gets it. So by chronosing spy camps, chronos project was included in my deck because it was a very strong uh, counter to spy camps. If any spy camp player is unaware that you are running chronos project, you can really uh, hammer them down really hard if they don't pre-levy. Uh, because they run out of ways to break ice uh, if they are spy camp Haley. and in both cases spy camp Haley or spy camp gas guys you kill the spy camps which means that you no longer have to worry about r&d pressure now opponent draws his entire deck so now all his solutions are basically in his hand he tries for a or r&d does not get the agenda my goal i shuffle biotic labels because that is what i really need to win the game i think i have the winning agenda Actually, I'm not sure. Um, but either way, that is why I need to assemble to win at this point. I, all I need to do is to defend my centrals and find Baltic into a 3-2 for the win. So it's at this point I, that I kind of regret not tossing an agenda into the Ash remote. You notice that, that Ash and Jackson in the Architect Turing remote has been sitting there for ages. Had that been an agenda or a Chronos project, I would be in a much better place right now. I would have an extra Baltic in my hand. I would poss possibly have an agenda to score, etc. So I'm really, really sad that uh, I didn't actually, I wasn't more ballsy on that front. Anyway, uh, my opponent's very poor. That's the good news. So I'm just going to ice up R&D right here because there are no three tools in my hand. The only agenda in my hand is a Chronos Project, which is useless to me because it won't win me the game. And it's pretty useless to my opponent because it won't win him the game either. So. Um, I let that slide, and he plays a bunch of stuff, and tries to get into my hand um, with a legwork. This was a legwork run. Um, let's rewind it a bit. Yep, he plays the shift as his first click. His second click is to play legwork. There you see the legwork there. He uses a bunch of cloud breakers to break, getting a lot of money, and he's going to access three cards. There is an upgrade in the base of the server. I could rest the Ash, but again, it doesn't really matter here. The Kronos project is not going to win either of us the game. So I'm happy to let him have it. And he does find it, bringing him up to six points. And it's very unfortunately that uh, he did try to run R&D as well. Forcing me to rest the toll booth, going down 3 credits, which means that I can't actually score. 
Um, but in a few more turns, because he's locked down on R&D so hard, with Tollwolf, it is almost impossible for him to get through Tollwolf. Keep this in mind. Looking at his board state, he only has a couple of credits left. Two credits in fact, and all he sees is a Biotic Labor. He tried to get through R&D and failed. So at this point, it's impossible for my opponent to run through R&D for the next few turns. He wants to click 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 for credits. It costs him 8 credits to break through a Toll Wolf. Um, 3 to break an Architect. That is very expensive. He doesn't have any income because I stopped his levy. He doesn't have many trashable cards left on his board, so Tech Trader money is now dead. Unfortunately, at this point, as I was going to take my turn, time was called. So when time is called, I can only I can um I can make one turn. My opponent plays his one turn, and then whoever has more gender points wins. Obviously, I was only on three credits, and I didn't have the Baltic uh, agenda for the win. Even if I did, I didn't have enough money to play it. So I lost. Yeah. Um. This loss actually hurt me really bad. Uh, that I that was a very very ugly way to go out. Uh, because as I mentioned, as I explained, I basically had an arm lock on this game. My opponent was drawing dead. No cards left in deck. No way to get economy. And all I had to do is to click for credits until I found a three two for the win. R and D was watertight. There was no way he was getting in, and there were no other agendas on the board. Instead, I lost because I wasn't keeping track of time. Had I known that time would be called this early, I would actually have raised the ash on HQ to deny the leg work. That would not have been a sensible play in any other circumstance because that would erase the ash on the remote, preventing me from scoring a global food if I needed to. It was also uh, completely unsensible because that Kronos project was not going to win my opponent the game, but in this case, it did because it pushed my opponent to 6 points. Um, if we enter the game on a tie, the higher seed moves on, and I was the higher seed. So, uh, one big learning point I took away from this is that from now on, whenever I go to any tournament, I will keep track of time myself. Um, I could also have asked my opponent to play faster. Uh, my opponent was taking rather long with his time, but I respect that. I think that Runner is a game, is a thinker's game. And uh, I accord my opponents uh, uh, respect to play the game at their pace, at a pace that's comfortable to them, because I would wish for them to accord the same respect to me. I do need some time to think out my turns as well, and I really appreciate it when my opponents give me that. As such, I really cannot bring myself to call time on my opponents. So the best thing I could have done there was to keep track of time myself, and to adjust my play such that I wouldn't lose on the gender points uh, due to time. This was super super unfortunate because I really really wanted to play out the game and it feels like uh, given the board state and how I had control of the game, the outcome was not one that reflected that. I'm going to be honest about it. The way this game ended, coupled with the intentional draw situation that happened during a tournament, marred my experience of it and made the weekend rather unfulfilling, which was unfortunate. But let's put that behind us, and I would like to thank, proceed to thank some people. Uh, the organizers, uh, Coop, CJ, Unitled, Steven, and all the other uh. TOs and organizers, they stayed very long to count, uh, to deck check us, to make sure that our sleeves were in perfect condition, and to um, basically provide rulings all over the uh, all across the day. It's definitely not an easy job, and I really, really appreciate their efforts. Without them, this tournament wouldn't have been a success. So big props to them. I also like to thank the streamers for covering this event, Neo Red and Grid, Jono and uh, Joey. Without them. This video wouldn't have existed at all, right? Uh, thanks very much for providing coverage and uh, giving us such wonderful content. Do check out their Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash neoreddinggrid. That's where you can find the rest of the videos, uh, footage from Nationals, as well as their YouTube channel uh, for <coughs> a lot more awesome content from previous regionals. Uh, I'll leave links uh, to that in the description. 
I also like to thank the interviewees once again from my previous video uh, for sharing why they enjoy Netrunner so much. I like to thank uh, the viewers for expressing their support during nationals. Um, I was approached by a lot of people saying that my YouTube channel is awesome and they enjoy my content. I really, really appreciate every single one of your uh, praises. I can't say that enough. Um, this is what motivates me to continue uh, producing great content. So thanks to all of you once again. Also thanks to Chris for being a very good sport for uh, regarding the uh, game loss. Thanks to Team London for being so awesome and supportive and as well as anyone who I accidentally missed out. Really sorry, uh, so many people to name, can't name them all. Anyway, this is all for my Nationals coverage. Hopefully I can bring you all some more jank. Um, I really like Jammy HB and I'll still be playing it for a bit. You might see it during live streams but otherwise I'll try to move on uh, to explore Blood Money cards and 23 seconds cards and a uh, whole bunch of jank. Look forward to that. In the meantime, thanks for watching and happy net running. Goodbye.